Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of the Whiskey Culture Podcast, your wide window into the world of whiskey. And today we have the mastermind behind Black Button Distillers, Jason, with us. How you doing, Jason? I'm doing good. Thanks for having me, Greg. Absolutely. It is a pleasure to talk to you again. So we were actually out at Black Button. Um, we did an episode of the Rick House. You can check that out on our YouTube. We're really, uh, we were really excited to have this partnership with Black Button. They're really focused on a lot of the things that we believe in, that traditional craft approach, no cutting corners, uh, just making a good quality product the way that it should be made, not cutting corners, making sure that everything's um, I mean, everything's really kosher. We we were there and everything was great. Yeah. Everything was exactly what we wanted to see. So, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, Jason, one of the things that I want to ask is how Black Button got started. I know that that's a uh, kind of a uh, a tale there, but we want to we want everybody to know how you all got started. What made you want to create Black Button? Well, most of it probably came down to I had a boss who drove me to drink. Um, but it probably starts a little earlier than that. Uh, I studied political science in college and actually did my senior thesis on prohibition, specifically how politicians talked people into voting for this um, and what the women's Christian temperance movement used to get you know, the other Volstead Act passed across the United States. In that research, I discovered that, uh, that you know, making beer as a hobby could be a thing. Uh, I started making beer in my basement uh, kept that up as a hobby for several years while I lived in DC. Eventually I started working for this accounting company and one of my first customers was Catoctin Creek, uh, rye whiskey out of Percyville, Virginia. And they found they got great customer service because anytime they had a question, I was happy to pop over there and talk to them in person. And, uh, after about a year of working with them on the accounting side, I sort of realized that you know, the corporate uh, nine to five wasn't quite for me. Making whiskey would uh, would scratch that itch of making great beverage uh, and craft beers. It kind of seemed like I had missed that wave. Uh, craft distilling was still newer. And uh, and at the end, you'd end up with whiskey. So I did what any reasonable 24 year old would do and quit my job, sold my house, moved out to Spokane, Washington and worked for dry fly distilling for a little while. There, I learned uh, double pass distillation, eventually got homesick. So left Washington, came back to Rochester, New York, my hometown, and uh, and off to the races uh, we went with Black Button. There were a few years in the middle there, but that's the paraphrase. That's crazy. I mean, to, to just kind of shut everything down and go learn to distill and to come back and bring it back to your hometown. What was that like, you know, bringing that back with you? I mean... Rochester has always been so supportive of us. Uh, it's a great food town, very passionate people. Um, and we've worked hard to, to give back to that community, but really they've given a lot more to us than I could ever hope to give back. Um, and yeah, it, it even surprised me how well we were received. Uh, we're about 150 feet south of the Rochester Public Market, the biggest farmer's market in New England, 1.3 million visitors per year. So certainly that location uh, helped us a lot. And uh, and then it's just putting one foot in front of the other every day and going out there and spreading the good word of what Rochester style whiskey can taste like. Well, that's awesome. What, uh, so we, we had this, you went and you learned to distill, you brought it back to Rochester. You've been here for a while. You've been creating this, this uh, just uh, amazing whiskey, this amazing distillery. Um, what are you all focused on right now? So the biggest uh, challenge for us right now is that a year from now, we won't be where we are today located. Um, so we are about to kick off construction, uh, just about eight days uh, on our new facility that we've been planning for three years. Uh, and it's a major upgrade. We're going from 5,000 square feet to 28,000 square feet. And we're going to go from making five barrels a day to 20 barrels a day. So yeah, it's going to be a, just again, a major step function upgrade, uh, but we're only moving about a mile down the road. Uh, so we'll still be right in downtown Rochester, same water, same grain, same guys running it, just some bigger equipment that should hopefully let us uh, take on some of those bigger jobs that we've started to get. 
You know, and one of the things that I, I really enjoyed when I was there uh, doing the Rick House was one of the things that you were focused on is that increasing the amount of whiskey that you all are producing, you all are keeping to the the true core of Black Button. You're making sure that that the whiskey supply doesn't outpace your ability to keep it craft which I think is, is really cool. Do you want to talk a little bit about how, um, about the, the transition between that, that five barrels a month to 20, or I mean a day to 20 barrels a day? Yeah. So, I mean, we want to be involved in every part of the process as a farm distillery. We're there when the corn goes in the ground, we are talking to our farmers, you know, every week doing field checks. Uh, you know, we have it custom harvested for us, dried for us, hammer milled for us. Um, and it's can it, you know, you can either call me a control freak or somebody that's really dedicated. But by being involved in each one of those parts of the process, we feel that we make whiskey unlike anybody else. Um, it's the recipe. It's the varietals of corn grown. It's how uh, we double pass everything through copper pot stills and as we move, there will certainly be changes, but we also have to keep true to that, uh, that original core. So for instance, everything for black button, you know, will be coming off our new bigger still as a stripping run, but we'll still get those low wines, pass them through a copper pot still, just like we do today, you know, hand tasting every batch, uh, to get the exact flavor profile we're looking for through that double pass distillation. So I certainly, uh, I certainly, respect folks that uh, that buy bulk Kentucky bourbon, uh, put it in a bottle, have a good story that goes along with that. It's just not our story. I don't know that that makes it right, wrong, or indifferent. It's just different. Um, yeah. So yeah, I mean, for us, we, we grow that corn in 400 feet of topsoil in the Genesee Glacial Valley. Uh, we are using Hemlock Lake water that's you know, brought down through the Rochester City water system. We're aging it in barrels coming from Adirondack Cooperage, just up in Remsen, New York. All of these little tweaks, which also add to the expense, make whiskey the way we want to make whiskey. And um, we don't have to be the biggest, but we certainly we certainly are working hard to make the whiskey the way we want to drink whiskey. And luckily, there seems to be a, a good number of people that want to join us in that quest, or I'd be a very lonely guy with a lot of barrels. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I learned a long time ago that you just can't skimp on the quality. And, um, you know, we are growing a little faster than we projected four years ago. So we do have to have that whiskey kind of allocated uh, across the 14 states we sell it in, uh, making sure that there's enough in the right markets. And, and you know, each each time we can sell a barrel, we can go make two more. So it's uh, it's a slow, steady climb up the mountain. And then yeah, you know, this and, again being a, a step function, but we'll yeah. Figure it and out. speaking speaking of the um, the grain to glass aspect of it, I think that's something that a lot of people don't realize is is everything that goes into a real grain to glass distillery. I know that's a, a term that's kind of tossed around a bit. You know, people say grain to glass and don't always mean it at the heart of of grain to glass. But you, I mean, that's what you guys are doing. Um, yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about that? I mean, it just makes for a much longer planning cycle. So for instance, we're currently discussing with our farm today, how much how much rye they should plant for the next round of uh, planting cycles, which we will end up harvesting in the summer of 2024, using the summer of 2024 through summer of 2025. So how much grain we need is directly dependent on how many barrels we can get, whether we're making rye whiskey or bourbon whiskey, how much of that is for us versus contract production we might be making for somebody else, where we, you know, we use Danko rye, which is this you know, big, plump, oily rye that makes a great flavor, but you get a lot less out per acre. So it's a, almost four times as expensive. Our contract clients don't want to pay for that. So it's not even just how much rye, it's how much Danko rye versus how much commercial rye do we end up needing to have planted because they need to order the seeds soon for us to take delivery in the summer of 24, for us to make products summer of 24 through 25 for whiskey that will probably be released in 2033. 
So, Greg, if you happen to know how much bourbon we're going to sell, like in the spring of 2033, <laughs> I, I could really use those numbers. It would would make the math a lot easier on my end. Um, and you're constantly just uh, juggling those things. Um, you know, and just when you think you've got it all worked out, a uh, you know, curveball gets thrown in. Um, you know, barrels are obviously in short supply right now, but they're also uh, there are places where you can get them. Um, and sometimes a tractor trail load comes up unexpectedly. So you can go from not nearly enough barrels to almost too many. You know, every, every one of these things is sort of balancing um, pretty much every 90 days. And, you know, being involved, you know, and, and you've got the weather. So, you know, not only do we have to decide how much grain we want, but what are those yields going to be? How much does our farm plant? What happens if we get too much rain or not enough rain? Um, and all those have to be factors taken into it. Now, luckily, our farm has 150 head of beef cattle. All of our spent grain goes back there. If we overachieve, if we, you know, if we grow too much, uh, we have an outlet where we can be sending it to those beef cattle to eat for breakfast. But even so, that can be very expensive. You know, again, with, with Danko rye being so much more expensive than corn, wheat, or commercial rye, um, you know, every acre that we plant that doesn't get turned into whiskey is quite expensive. And yet you also can't grow. If you don't grow enough, then you can't make that amount of whiskey, you know. So it, it's a, a juggling act. And, uh, and I haven't quite polished off my crystal ball just yet. Uh, we do we do okay with it, but uh, but every year we're learning and learning new things, and we get better at it. And off to the races we go. Yeah, I mean that's that's intense. You know, a lot of people they just think you know they just think grain comes in, grain gets milled. Gr you know, they create a mash. But to to hear about the cycle and to hear about how you have to create. Uh, such a long product cycle for black button. I mean, it's just a testament to the fact that you, and, and I mean, you do it so that you get a control point at every single one of these outlets to create something that you really want. It's, you know, something that you're really trying to create. And I think that that's, that's just an amazing thing that it goes all the way from just trying to figure out how much grain you need and, and which proportions of grain you need all the way down to one of these. <laughs> well, and I always I think it's probably because of my accounting background, but I always look at it as a big equation. You know, we're going to add this great grain to, you know, through these machines, we're going to multiply that by the quality of our staff. We're going to, you know, subtract out the angel share. And at the end, you have a product, you know, a number. But that means that anywhere along the way, as you start to adjust those things, you end up changing that end number quite a bit. So position in the warehouse, where the barrel came from, what size barrel it is, what time of year you lay that barrel down and what time of year you harvest it, the quality of the grain, the moisture content of the grain, the grind size of the grain. We had a really interesting thing happen in the early years. I had two part-time guys helping me, one on Monday, Wednesday, one on Tuesday, Thursday. And they're running my mash and we're consistently getting 7% more whiskey out on Tuesdays and Thursdays than on Mondays and Wednesdays. And the only difference, I mean, they're, they're following the same recipe schedule, using the same grain, using the same yeast. The only difference is the guy doing it. So finally, I take a couple days and I just watch these guys work because it's driving me nuts. How are we getting two different answers from the same project? And what I realized was that it came down to the size of the knife that the guy carried. And you would say, Jason, how on earth could the size of the pocket knife result in seven to 10% difference in the amount of whiskey coming out at the end of the equation. And the answer was that one guy carried a fairly large knife and he would cut the whole top off the bag and upend the whole thing. The other guy had a more normal size pocket knife where he would cut the corner off and slowly pour the grain in. Well, it turns out when you upend the whole bag and drop 50 pounds of grain right into the hot water, the grain ends up balling up and about 7% of the starch is no longer available. So if you want to talk about getting specific, we actually require our guys' pocket knives to be no longer than four inches. 
That I mean, that's crazy. Just all yes. the way down to to, to how you... the size of the pocket knife in the guy's pocket. That is and yet, insane. If you, don't, if you don't adjust and control for those, it creates real problems. And at this point, we you know we uh, we have augers that move the grain in. Not as much uh, worried about the back. But yeah, even the way that grain gets poured in, um, the exact strike temperatures, the chemical composition of the water, all of these things have to be right to get that final product to taste the way we want it to. That's amazing. So what um, what other projects do you all have? I know you all you do a uh, pretty popular blending program. Is that right? Yeah. So one of the other interesting things, you know, we, we can, we can try to control for all these variables. And at the end, all we know is that each barrel is going to taste uniquely different. You know, the staves that are in that tree with the position in the warehouse, again, the time of year that it went down, that exact distillation run, we can work for years to control as much of that as we can, but every barrel ends up being different. And I think not enough credit and there's pl several places actually where i think our industry really has to focus good quality fermentation which leads to good distillation but the the last product the blending of the bourbon so if you just go in and say hey i want a hundred barrels that are over four years old just go get the next hundred by number um you can do that and and you can dump them into into the troughs and and the whiskey will be good don't get me wrong it, it's not awful but you've left such an opportunity because now you're just dealing with averages. And so yeah. what we like to do is every barrel gets tried and basically one of five things can happen. We can harvest it into our sweet tank. So a tank where mostly the barrels are sweet, a uh, spice tank, our oak tank, or our kind of uh, base tank where it's good, ready whiskey that's ready to bottle, but sweet spice oak or base is not the defining characteristic. And don't be wrong, in the sweet tank, the, the whiskey is spicy and oaky. In the oak tank, it's sweet and spicy, but it's what's that predominant flavor. Um, and if it doesn't get picked, we put a date on it and we pick when we're gonna taste it again. So is this a barrel that needs another year? Is it a barrel that needs another three months? Do we just need to get to the next change of season? Um, and, uh, and most barrels get tasted two or three times before they get picked to go into the blend. So those four tanks are constantly being refilled, almost a little Solera system inside our own distillery. Um, we're pretty much every week, we're putting a couple more barrels in and proofing that down and slowly letting those you know 20 barrels marinate together to make almost a pre-blend. And then when Jeff and I need to make bourbon, we will go through each of those barrel, or each of those uh, tanks, and we will combine a little bit of this, a little bit of that to get that signature black button flavor that we want for our products. But what's interesting, what we realized is that if, if you move these around, even by a few percent, two or 3% more of spice totally changes the flavor profile. So maybe you like your whiskey a little more oaky and spicy. Maybe somebody else likes it sweet and oaky. May, and almost everybody wants to leave out the base tank because it doesn't have the sexy name like the other three. <laughs> what we found is if you don't have that base layer to kind of tie it all together, uh, the whiskey really doesn't work. So we always encourage folks to use some of that. So although Jeff and I make the blends that go out just as Black Button, we'll have stores in. Uh, we have uh, an army unit com has come in recently to do one. And we can blend from those four tanks something that is still signature black button, but unique to that person or that group that day. And because the tanks are constantly being refilled and drawn from, you know, even if you came back to us two years later and you're like, hey, mine was 25, 30, 20, 25, just run that again. It won't taste the same again. So it lets us create really unique whiskey experiences that really are only once in a lifetime. And that's really cool. And one of, one of the things that's amazing is that, it, you know, like you said, it caters to the flavor profile. You're able to tweak 
that flavor profile for, for different individuals. So let's say that there is a group of people that want a little bit of a sweeter whiskey, or there is a group of people that want something a little oakier. Um, they're able to come in and work with you to create kind of an, I, I mean, an ideal flavor profile for them, which is such a unique concept. Yeah. I mean, I don't know of anywhere else where you really get to drive that flavor and do the the iterations to get it exactly where you want it. And oftentimes we're even down to like a, a half or a quarter of a percent at the very end. And that even that can make slight shifts. Um, it really was an outgrowth of the fact that we saw the popularity of single barrels, but we hold our single barrels to an incredibly high standard. So we only end up seeing about 1.5 to 1.8% of our barrels turn into single barrels, which for us means it has the sweet, the spice, the oak, the base, the mid palate, the finish, the exhale, the nose, basically no flaws, perfect score. And that just means we don't have very many of them. And I didn't want to move to where we were lowering the quality standard for single barrels. So we wanted an opportunity to be able to interact with these groups, to get them a custom experience, but be able to hold that level of quality that, that we think is so important. Well, that's incredible. Um, yeah, one of the things, <laughs> yeah, well, you're succeeding. We, uh, we did a whiskey culture blend with you all that, that uh, was pretty popular down here that we enjoyed um, sold out pretty quick. But uh, I can only imagine groups coming in and creating those those blends with you all. How, you know, just how cool it would be to interact with them and see how many different palettes roll through. Um, one of the things that I want to ask about uh, as we kind of get into this this final leg of the podcast is I know you said you guys are moving, but what's what's the big vision for Black Button? If there's a picture where you take a, a step back. And you have that whole picture that you're trying to paint. What does that picture look like? So, I mean, a lot of it is uh, is things we've already realized, which is to make the highest quality bourbon, uh, rye, and malt whiskey here in Rochester from locally grown ingredients that we can. Uh, but we think we have the potential to make a good bit more of that um, and really help spread that message across New York, New England, and hopefully through DTC, maybe the rest of the country. We don't need to chase Jack Daniels, Jim Beam, uh, Buffalo Trace. You know, I, I respect the hell out of those guys and the volumes that they produce, but we we don't need to hit that. Um, and the, the size we're jumping to 20 barrels a day still allows us to taste every barrel, touch every barrel, be involved in making sure that just the best items end up in that final blend. Um, and, you know, and I think that will be enough for us. I, and I say that ironically because, you know, at that scale, um, we will be the largest independently owned distillery in New England. Um, you know, and one of the largest production sites outside of Kentucky. Uh, so that that's all we're shooting for at the moment. <laughs> That's it. Um, that's that, that's it. That's the little the little goal, right? Yeah, yeah. The the big, hairy, <laughs> audacious, but still tiny. I mean, and to put some of this into comparison, the new Heaven Hill site um, in Bardstown will make more in a day than my new facility will make in a year, and yet my new facility will make in a year what we have not made in eleven years uh, at our current facility. So that is just the, the kind of the mind boggling scale differences of this industry. And we don't want to get so big that we can't taste every barrel, pick our blends. Sure, our tanks are going to get bigger uh, as we're doing some of these things, but uh, we don't want to lose what we feel has made us great. Because at that point, why should people buy Black Button? You know, I mean, a lot of what they're paying for is that quality, consistency, that art and love that goes into every bottle. Because I know there's cheaper whiskey out there. And I know there's older whiskey out there, but certainly our goal is that we always have the best whiskey for the age that we have. Um, you know, I have not tasted Black Button 15 year yet, and it will probably be another seven to 10 years before I get to. Uh, but at that point, I hope to have a few barrels that again can swing 
with uh, the 15 year olds on the market. Well, that's amazing. And I, I love the vision that you're not so focused on just creating the biggest machine that you can. You're focused on making sure that each of those, that each of the, the pieces, each of the cogs mesh together the same way that you have them now. You know, the way that you have to, to scale uh, with, with keeping the soul of Black Button intact. I think that that's such an important thing that you've brought up is making sure that the soul of the distillery stays the same in regards to the scale and, and the increasing of, of volume that you're doing. And to some degree, I, I certainly never want to imply that scale and quality are diametrically opposed, but rather that it is that you do kind of have to pick one to focus on. And it's very hard um, to scale really high quality. I mean, again, I'm sure everybody listening to this has been to a great family owned steakhouse with you know, wood fired grills and you just had a steak that blew you away that you probably remember to this day. And for what it's worth, Applebee's sells a lot more steak than that, you know, homegrown family wood fired steak place ever will. But let's be honest, Applebee's steak, which don't be wrong, if you're on a, a road trip and just, you know, looking for a good bite, I'm not knocking Applebee's, but you I, I think that to standardize and spread out as wide as Applebee's, McDonald's, Taco Bell, you can't really shoot for the highest quality. Those, those two ideas just don't overlap that much. And so although yeah. we are getting big for craft, uh, we never want to lose those key components. You know, ultimately, at the end of the day, buying bulk whiskey out of Indiana would, I'm sure, be much more profitable. I have lots of friends that do it. Um, and I'm happy to drink their stuff, but for my whiskey with my name on it, I want it to come from corn, put in the ground in Groveland, New York, and have controlled every little thing along the way to get the whiskey the way I want it. And luckily enough, people seem to agree with me that I can make a living at it. That's amazing. So how can people follow the black button story? How do, how do they follow you all? So if you just hop over to our website, blackbuttondistilling.com, um, we've got a place you can pop your email address in. We send about one every 15 days. Uh, following us on Facebook and Instagram are also great, and those links are available at our website. Uh, and then obviously, uh, you know, listening to great whiskey podcasts like Whiskey Culture uh, is a good way to, to hear about us as well. Awesome. Well, Jason, I appreciate you being with us today and sharing the story of Black Button uh, sharing a bit about where you guys have come from, where you are and where you're headed. Um, we are looking forward to seeing you guys again real soon. And um, yeah, let's, let's stay in touch. And once you guys get into the new facility, maybe we'll, we'll take a trip up there and check it out. We'd love to have you, Greg. Awesome, Jason. Well, thank you so much for joining us and thank you all for listening to another episode of the whiskey culture podcast your wide window into the world of whiskey, and we'll see you next time. Cheers.